Hi everybody, it's Wanda. Today I'm gonna to do a short little talk about some things that if you're new, if you're a beginner, if you are not a painter, haven't been an artist before, you may not know these things and it might be some useful information to you. And so I'm just gonna bring up some stuff that I've learned over the last 30 years uh, and tell you that I initially started teaching myself to paint in the 90s. Um, watching Bob Ross, of course, and then there were two other artists that I watched on PBS, on TV all the time. One was Gary Jenkins, Jenkins and his wife Catherine, and they did beautiful florals, and they use oil paints, and they paint wet into wet. That means that they put something on the canvas first to keep the canvas wet. It could be paint, it could be medium, just to wet that canvas so that when they put their brush down with the oil paint on it, it goes faster and smoother and blends out better. The other person, and I highly recommend finding this man on the internet or on YouTube, or if you can, sometimes he you can still find him on PBS on television, and his name is Jerry Yarnell, and he is a wonderful painter, and he will take you step by step through a painting so detailed that it's, he will tell you we're gonna use our number two brush, we're gonna use these paints and mix them together, and he does a lot of paint mixing, so it's a good way to learn to mix your paints to get different colors, and he uses gesso as his white, and he will take a little bit of gesso, a little bit of burnt umber, a little bit of ultramarine blue, and mix it together and use that as like a, a shadow color or um, a background color or whatever he needs. But he will literally walk you through a painting, usually in 13 episodes that are hour-long episodes on PBS. You can also find him on the internet, Jerry Yarnell Fine Art, and he has videos that he sells of various paintings and he does everything. He does landscape, he does animals, he does people. He just, he, he's a wonderful artist and you can learn so much. He teaches about composition, um, angles and perspective and all kinds of things that you can learn from him. So if you really want to learn to paint, uh, I highly recommend watching his videos. I owned a bunch of them and donated them to my art league when I left Florida um, many years ago. So. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to go over was canvas. You may think that canva buying canvas is just buying canvas, but it really isn't. They're used to only, as far as I remember, now they may have had it back in the day. The gallery wrap might have been available in the 90s, but from what I remember, most of them were like this. They had staples all down the side. And they come usually in a regular canvas or a portrait smooth. The portrait smooth basically is they have put two to three layers of gesso on it and then they have sanded them down to make it very silky, very smooth. That's really helpful for portraits if you're doing portraits or if you're doing something that has a lot of fine detail in it, like flowers for instance, that would be really good to have the portrait smooth. As I have told you in the past, you can take a very, you know, fine sanding sponge. I like the little thin ones. They're only about this thick. And sand down your canvas if it has a really rough texture on it, which is called tooth. That's the weave of the fabric where they have sprayed the gesso on it in the manufacturing process and not sanded it down. And the more open weave a canvas is, the bigger the holes, the more the gesso piles up, and the more peaks that you get, which causes it to be very rough. So that's your regular, you know, which is what most of us buy, is the regular. A student quality is usually, you can tell for sure, if it's a student or a mid-grade canvas by the weight, and it will always give it on the front of your package, it will tell you what the weight of that cotton is that has been stretched and then primed with gesso. So 
An eight ounce cotton is a student grade. A 10 ounce can even be a student grade, depending on how good of stretcher bars they use. Um, if I were to get a commission to do, say, a 24 by 30, and I was charging $500 for it, I would get the highest, best grade of canvas that I could get, which is 13 to 15 ounces. They're very expensive, but they will hold up for a long time, and they will hold a lot of paint depending on the technique that you're using, you may have impasto on there. Or you may put layer after layer after layer to build it up so that you get uh, the kind of effect that you want. So those are grades that are, they're, they're ounces. You're going to look at your canvas and see how many ounces it says. Most of the ones that we get from Michaels, I believe, is a 10 ounce canvas, which is fine. And it's fine for pouring. There's no point in spending 10 tons of money and buying the very best, to me, for a pour. It, it, especially if you're doing them, if you're doing a lot of them. And you don't have the budget to really get in there and spend a ton of money. And most people that buy them will never know the difference one way or the other. But, like I said, if I was going to charge somebody a lot of money for a decent sized canvas, I would want it to be good quality canvas. And they would know that right up front. I would tell them that up front. So, um, you have your side staple and your gallery wrap. There's also one that's called a museum wrap. I really didn't know the difference between a gallery and a museum wrap. I thought, honestly, that a museum wrap was deeper. It was a gallery wrap, which means that your staples are on the back side of the canvas and it's wrapped all the way around and it's a bit deeper normally, but you can get gallery wraps that are only three quarters of an inch deep. That's what these are. And um, so you can, when I went in and, and researched it this morning, basically what I found out was like, if you buy a canvas print and you buy it in mu museum quality canvas print, the print is gonna be on the front and down the side is going to be a solid color. That's what hangs, that's the way they hang them in a museum, I guess. Um, I watched a silk artist on TV yesterday and he, on YouTube, and he said that he, he stretches his silk and adheres it to a canvas. And he said he used museum wrap canvas and it looked like just a regular deep sided gallery wrap canvas. So that was one thing that made me kind of wonder and brought it to the forefront of my mind. What's the difference? And what he did was he put his silk on, he went around the edge and taped, and then he painted black gesso on the sides. And that's what I think gave him his museum type of hanging um, to actually hang it and make it look good. But also I have noticed that with museum, you can get like a two inch deep, a three inch deep even, so on the sides, the sides would be three inches deep. That's, that's big. I mean, if you've got it hanging off a wall, it's really gonna stick out there. So that's a little information that I just found out that I thought was really interesting. I've told you about the gallery wrap versus the museum wrap, the side staple versus the gallery wrap. Now I do buy canvas from Dick Blick. They have gallery wrap canvas in two different fashions. Uh, one is gallery wrap back stapled with extra canvas so that in the event that you ever wanted to or needed to restretch that canvas, there would be plenty of canvas there for them to stretch it again without worrying about losing your initial painting. And so that's the way they sell those, and that's why they sell them that way. They're really, they have really big pieces of canvas on the back. It doesn't stop short like this one does. Um, the type that I like are the splined canvas, and that's the ones that I buy in the gallery wrap. I get the Dick Blick Premier Cotton gallery wrap that is splined, and it actually, I don't have one sitting here. I don't think that is not taped up. <laughs> um, 
this is one I think that nope that's not the same kind that's just a gallery wrap but his um, the Dick Blick ones uh, when they wrap the canvas around they have it wrapped around the stretcher bar and then a piece of wood up against it the only staple that you see is one in each corner and that's so appealing and it's so clean and neat looking and it holds the canvas tighter that's another thing about student grade versus really good quality. If you get a student grade, you know that it can be pretty sloppy and you have to spray the back of it to get it to tighten up. On the more expensive canvas, they stretch them tighter. Their quality is higher and they often do not need to be sprayed on the back to tighten that canvas up because that canvas is already tight and that's one another thing i like about the blick ones i get the ones that are 12 by 12 uh, from another place but i get my 20 by 30s 24 by 30s and my bigger canvases i always get from blick and they're really good quality and rarely do they dip at all they're usually very taut so the cheaper ones could need tightening, and you know how to do that. You just pick up your spray bottle, spray the back of it. I spray into the corners because I found that they'll pucker if you don't. So um, I spray that and let it kind of run down in there and make sure that it's good and tight. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about is cleaning your brushes. If you do brush work, clean your brushes five times more than you think you need to. You will think that you have that brush clean, and trust me, if you don't keep going, it very well may not be clean. So I like to use on my acrylic paints brushes, I use lye soap, the kind that my mom made as I was growing up on the farm in Kentucky. Lye soap has the fat in it to really condition your bristles, but it doesn't leave a oily residue. So I really like my lye soap and I'll wash out my brush with water until I get it running clean. Then I'll work that lye soap into it, work it in really good. And I will wash it and rinse it, wash it and rinse it at least four or five times. And then if I think that there's any residue left, I use alcohol. I use uh, regular rubbing alcohol and dip that brush in that alcohol and then take a paper towel and try to work any paint that's up close to the metal, which is called a ferrule. Um, and get that paint out because it will dry hard as the rock. Now, if you do have a situation where you didn't get a brush clean and it's really hard, I have found that you can soak house painting brushes that I've used to clean, you know, paint my house, but you can also soak your um, acrylic brushes in, gr in not grease lightning, but um, mean green. I like to use mean green to help clean those out too. Let them soak, and it seems like it'll loosen that paint up where you can literally take a rag and just wipe it and pull it and pull it until you get it off. So cleaning your brushes is very important, and if you're going to put them away and store them and you, have, you know you're not going to use them for a few weeks, use a hair gel that is a water-based hair gel and shape your brushes and let that dry. And, it, you know, when you buy a brush and it's stiff, it's because they have a protection on there. And you need to rinse it in water to get that off because it's water-based. And hair gel will work the very same way. So, for oil painting, I like to clean my brushes in the turp, and turpentine, and I use the non-odor, low-odor turpentine. Um, I usually use turpenoid. It's worth the extra money to me. And I clean the oil out of my brush the best I can with that. Then I wash it with Grease Lightning. Grease Lightning will cut the oil right out of your brushes, but it's a little hard on your brush, so you do need to condition it afterwards. And what you can do to condition that is use a good mineral oil, or you can use lard. If you have lard that you cook with or know how to get your hands on some, you can use lard. It's really good to condition your brushes because most of those are going to be badger hair or a really good brush that is a natural hair that's in there and I, you can also use grease lightning to strip all the paint off of a canvas even if it's dry that's an oil painting i was amazed when i heard that i had a friend tell me that that had been his wife had been painting for over 40 years and i tried it and it absolutely works i took it out in the yard i sprayed it with grease lightning I let it sit for a little bit, took the hose and washed that paint off and then scrubbed the canvas really good with some more grease lightning and it did definitely take it off. 
So that's a way to save a canvas if you've done an oil painting over it. Of course, you can, you can gesso with acrylic. If you don't like the way the painting looks, you can gesso over it, let it dry, and then do another painting over that. Now, I wouldn't do that for a pour because pours are so wet. But for a brush painting, yes, not a problem at all. So I'm going to stop talking about that because I know that's probably bored you all to death now. I wanted to show you some uh, paintings that I have embellished. Oh, and another one I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you this one. This is one that was a pour that I did and painted my octopus on it. And one thing that happened whenever it started to dry was it warped. The canvas warped because... There were knot holes in the stretchers. Now, I bought this canvas at Walmart. It was, I think, $12.95 or something like that, which is a good price. It's a 24 by 30. But it literally popped up there. Let's see if I can show you in the canvas, in the camera. If you can tell, it bent right in this area where the knot holes were from the water that was in the canvas that soaked through and soaked into that stretcher bar. And because of the knot holes, it made it just really round out right there. So it cannot be framed in this condition. It needs this stretcher bar taken off and a new one put on it. So that's something to watch for when you're shopping. If you can see, especially on a bigger canvas, if you can see inside that plastic wrap and tell, make sure that there are no knot holes in your wood on the stretcher bar. So there's one that I embellished. Here's one that I did before I started going on camera. It was a pour, and I um, embellished it with a lizard. These are called skinks. We have them here in Tennessee, and the immature ones, the baby ones, have a blue tail, and I mean a really, really bright tail, and those will pop off if they get scared and you come towards them too fast. They really pop their tails off as a distraction so they can get away. But I thought that was a cute way to embellish that pour because to me it looks almost like rock or like wood. Um, this is one pour that I did recently, and I said it looked like desert, so I put a camel on it, and I think it turned out cute. I just wanted to show you all what I ended up doing with it. I think I talked about it at the time, that it looked kind of like it was uh, a desert landscape, so I thought the camel would look cute on there, and so I put him on there with markers, and this is one that I worked on that was a yucky pour. And I have posted this in my Facebook group, so if you're in the same painting group that I'm in, you might see this. But this was a pour that I didn't like. And so I put some black paint over parts of it. I put some colored paints in places. I made the big star and the planet and embellished that one that way. And this one was another yucky pour that I didn't like. And so I did it with a comet I don't know which is the right side up, but I did it with uh, planets and comets, and I listed this one on Fine Art America, and I have sold one of those prints. Only one, but I had sold one. So I just thought you might get an idea off seeing those, something that you can do. Um, if you don't think you're a painter, watch videos, because there are some things that you could do these are really easy. The hardest part is just feathering out that white paint around the edge there. And you can put in a comet. That's not hard to do. A star is not that hard to do. Um, and you can just put in some of this area right in here that kind of looks like, you know, clouds or streams of matter or whatever going through the universe and then splatter it with a toothbrush. It's not that hard. I'm telling you, it's not that hard. You can do this. And so I just wanted to show you some things, tell you some things, and I didn't have a poor video to post today, so I thought I would do this. Hopefully it'll help somebody, encourage you, maybe even inspire you, and um, I hope that that was interesting information and you benefit from it. So thank you for watching. Catch you later. I'll post another video of a painting tomorrow. Thank you.